He served as a peacemaker, he served as a refugee worker, and he served as an administrator at the highest levels, serving as Under Secretary General during the Kofi Annan leadership in the organization. Dr. Thirur is also an award-winning author of works of both fiction and non-fiction books. Please welcome Dr. Shashi Thirur to the stage. Your Excellency, uh, Dr. Ahmed Al Saidi, Honorable Minister of Health, Mr. Abdul Latif, Managing Director of Badr al Sama, and of course his fellow Managing Director, Dr. P. A. Muhammad, my good friend, Ambassador Amit Naring of India, other distinguished diplomats, guests, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I know it's a cliche, but it genuinely is a pleasure to join you this evening for the celebrations of the 20th anniversary of the Badr al Sama group of hospitals, which has enjoyed a meteoric rise in these two decades, as we just saw in the video, from its genesis with its first small polyclinic to its position today as the largest private healthcare group in the Sultanate of Oman. I'm told that today the group has expanded to include over 20 centers, boasting of over 400 doctors and 2,000 allied medical staff who have provided quality health care to over 300, I beg your pardon, 30 million patients across Oman, the UAE, Bahrain, Qatar, and Kuwait. Let me take this opportunity to con congratulate not just the two directors, but the entire leadership team and each member of this group for achieving such remarkable results in such a short span of time, a testament to your common commitment to providing an invaluable humanitarian service to this society and to the world in general. As an Indian MP, I'm always heartened to see the role played not just by Indian management professionals, the ones I've congratulated, but of course by Indian doctors and nurses who have acquired a worldwide reputation for dedication and professional excellence. You have merged your talents and commitments with the resources and capabilities of Oman, and of course of its leadership exemplified by the health minister here today to produce such impressive results so rapidly. I've always believed that this ability of our expatriates, especially if I may be allowed to be parochial by fellow Malayalis, to embrace the culture and environment of a foreign land, to help build up local communities, and ultimately to thrive in global enterprises is a strong testament to your remarkable fortitude, resilience, and sense of purpose. To my fellow Indian citizens present in this room, as I've consistently argued, you're not just NRIs in the official definition of non-resident Indians, but through your impressive achievements, you've made all of us back home proud to recognize all of you as a different kind of NRI, the National Reserve of India. Now, the organizers have asked me to share with you my observations on the global healthcare system, but I'm conscious that my audience today is already far more knowledgeable than me on this very topic. It's like being the hydrologist who was invited to deliver a speech on flooding and discovered Noah sitting in the audience. It's the same sort of problem with all these doctors, nurses, healthcare experts, and the Honorable Minister of Health right there in the front. I don't think I should do that. Let me instead offer you a few general observations on urgent reforms that are needed in public health care. From my personal perspective, principally, as an Indian lawmaker. Let me first begin by pointing out there's a global opportunity and perhaps a fresh new drive even when it comes to matters of healthcare that is perhaps the one silver lining of the COVID pandemic. Through the trials and challenges that have manifested themselves during the pandemic, the unquantifiable pain and losses that we've all at some level faced as individuals, families, and communities. The COVID-19 pandemic has offered a sobering reminder to all of us of the fragility of our own humanity and 
the importance of securing our personal health. Even as we slowly begin to see the light at the end of the tunnel, in fact, the minister and I were discussing before we began this evening whether perhaps Omicron, the Omicron virus might turn out to be the vaccine the whole world has been waiting for, distributed to all around the world without the kind of biases and, and problems we have, imbalances we have seen in the other vaccines that have been distributed. So if that happens, and we all hope that this dark chapter in our collective histories is ending and that we can turn the page on this pandemic, there is an unsaid commitment that all of us have made to shore up the defenses of the communities we live in and to develop an environment that safeguards our health against such threats in future. Increased spending on healthcare is one sign of this. Now, while estimates vary, projections from the Brookings Institution have suggested that the world may be looking at a $4.4 trillion increase in global spending on public health care, especially amongst developing countries. The developed ones are perhaps already spending up to, full, uh, up to their full extent because they're, they're developed and they can afford to do that. But for the rest of us, we know that it's a matter of life and death and we need to spend more. And therefore, public health care alone is likely to increase a 7%, is to cause a 7% increase in global GDP by 2040. So while this is a welcome development, they're not altogether surprising, there were smaller versions of this in the aftermath of the SARS outbreak, the Ebola outbreak. I'd argue that increasing this public health spending must really focus on two areas principally. One, the expansion of healthcare infrastructure, and two, the ability of ordinary people to actively access quality health care. If we look at expansion, well, in seeing all the Indian, Indians in the audience today, especially doctors and medical support staff, uh, I am, sorry to say, reminded of the rather sobering situation back at home, where we have a doctor-to-patient ratio of almost 1 to 2,000, which is unfortunately only half of what the WHO recommends of one doctor to every 1,000 people. So we clearly do not have enough doctors, um, and, and in some ways, uh, it, a, a painful reminder of this has happened during the current Ukraine crisis, where you've all seen on television the plight of some 23,000 Indian medical students in Ukraine. And I think it's, it's reflective of the fact that there are simply not enough seats available in India for the demand, and that's why so many of our students have to go out and pursue medical studies in countries like Ukraine, Georgia, China, and Kazakhstan, all of which are places where I found our medical students were during the COVID pandemic and we had to bring them back. Now in India every year, uh, around 55,000 doctors and 25,000 postgraduate specialists emerge from our medical schools clutching their degrees. This should ideally have left us <coughs> with a more favorable doctor to patient ratio. But as the parliamentary committee found, we'd have to add something like 100 medical colleges every year for the next five years to get an adequate number of medical professionals graduating, uh, even by the end of this decade. And how qualified they will be is another matter. We seem to be sending the cream of the crop here and to America and elsewhere rather than retaining them in India. Now, of course, to be fair, this is not a uniquely Indian problem. Across the world, countries that have even achieved the WHO targets, like the US, the US, in fact, exceeds those targets. They have 2.6 physicians per 1,000 population. Even such countries have struggled to respond to the drastic influx of patients during the pandemic. Now, you could counter-argue this was a unique challenge, but let's not forget that the World Health Organization estimates a staggering global shortage of 12 million healthcare workers around the globe by 2035. And that situation cannot be ignored unless we have a dramatic increase in education of medical and healthcare workers, there will be a global shortage of as many as 12 million people. 
Now, in order for us to arrest this development, especially the limited presence of doctors in the public healthcare systems of many countries, we need to improve both the conditions and incentives for our doctors to pursue their career within public health systems. It's all very well to ask doctors to recognize, as I often do when I address convocations of medical colleges, that healthcare is not just a career but a calling, that there is a mission, not a profession involved. And yet they are human beings at the end of the day, and we must create conditions of service that will allow doctors to thrive. Just look at the case of the Sultanate of Oman. It started off with just 13 expatriate physicians in the entire country in 1958. There are two hospitals and a doctor to patient ratio of one to 50,000. Not, not one to 1,000, which I'm complaining about in India, but uh, I'm sorry, one to 2,000 as in India, but one to 50,000. But thanks to the visionary leadership of His Majesty Sultan Qaboos and leaders like indeed His Excellency Dr. Hamid Al Saidi and his predecessors as Ministers of Health, you now have an impressive doctor to patient ratio of 2.1 to 1,000, which is closer to the US than to India. And these doctors are supported by 4.5 nurses per 1,000, working in a healthcare ecosystem where over 95% of the population now lives within five kilometers of a good primary healthcare center. Now that's something that very few developing countries actually have. Now to turn to the challenge of access, in addition to quality and the presence of qualified personnel, the second challenge that many countries across the world have to work to address is that of access, especially to public health care. To go back to the Indian case study, the brunt of expenditure falls on ordinary men and women everywhere. Between 70 and 80 percent of India's health care costs are borne out of pocket. There's no insurance covering them. Medical bills alone have plunged nearly 40 million people into poverty. 40 million people who are living above the poverty line have dropped below it when they fall grievously ill, especially when the breadwinner falls ill. Unpredictable health expenditure has driven 363 millions already living below the poverty line into a dark abyss, particularly, as I said, when the family's main and often only breadwinner is afflicted by serious illness. 47% of admissions into hospitals in rural India and 31% of admissions in urban India are actually financed by loans or the sale of essential assets, including the home in which they live. The poor have to give away everything they possess in order to afford health care. And most of our people live just one illness away from destitution. Now that's true in many, many developing countries, but India is the country I know best, so I give you figures from there. Now, as a public policy issue, I'm, I'm not at all critical. In fact, I welcome the fact that our more affluent or well-insured citizens can reach efficient private hospitals and that can even afford to have the latest technology. But I can't forget about the millions who are forced to rely on less well-equipped government hospitals or cheaper private hospitals and clinics. As a lawmaker, I support the need to allow private entities to participate in the healthcare system. But at the same time, as I've often argued, the joys of the free market will not appeal to those who cannot afford to enter the marketplace. Let me digress for a moment to ask you a question. What country in the world has the best patient to doctor ratio? Does anyone know? I'm sorry to say it's not Oman. It's even better than Oman. Who could that be? You'd be surprised the answer is Cuba. A country that for generations languished under economic sanctions imposed by the United States, even today has only limited resources at its disposal, and despite that, the WHO considers Cuba a role model in issues concerning healthcare and the accessibility and affordability of healthcare. Cuba has an infant mortality rate of 4.2 per thousand, lower than the US, a life expectancy rate of 78, similar to the US, but spreads just $813 per person on healthcare, whereas the US spends more than 12 times that, 
$403 per person in, in, in America. So what's happened is that Cuba has come up with a political leadership committed to healthcare, innovative approaches on primary healthcare centers and preventive care, and of course, extensive amount of medical education. So they produce a large number of doctors. Health is a human right under Cuba's constitution. Access to healthcare is universal and free, and medical education is fully sponsored by the government. Cuba, as a result, exports several doctors to other third world countries. It has a booming medical tourism industry, and it's a success story. Now, I'm not an admirer of the Cuban system necessarily, but on public health, they've shown us one way of solving the problem. Of course, our governance structure, the governance structure in Oman and many other countries is different. No one can replicate what each country does. But what it suggests to me is that an alliance between the state and private providers of health are in the best interests of the citizen. If you want to look at the future of healthcare across the world, the universality of access that Cuba guarantees, while we pursue it in the systems that we have, could involve precisely what we're seeing with Badr al-Sima's success. That is, that you have a private hospital working closely in tandem with the public health system and with the blessings and encouragement and even the patronage of the government. In a, in a developing country like India, public-private collaboration would help bridge massive enduring gaps, especially given the increasing interest shown by foreign institutions in setting up world-class medical education in India. Nursing schools, medical colleges, specialist training, and so on, to train healthcare workers that everyone needs. So a mutual understanding of the economics of healthcare, where patients' interests as well as providers' bottom lines are taken into account, should enable a fairer system to be put in place, prevent unethical profiteering, but not stifle productivity, innovation, and the capacity to expand and import the best technology. How we get there is another challenge, but with the right leadership, all challenges can be suitably navigated. Now, globalization has shrunk distances, sparked innovation, and indeed the exchange of ideas. It's lifted hundreds of millions out of poverty, want, and deprivation. But there's still a long way to go, and unless we keep the moral end of progress before our eyes, we will end up serving no larger purpose than the narrow interests of profit. Profit is not a dirty word, because it finances the innovations and the new techniques that you folks are here in Muscat to celebrate and to talk about. But it must not be pursued at the cost of the moral purpose of your profession, which is ultimately about saving lives. There's little point in saving the life of a man you have bankrupted in the process, and even less so if he didn't have a bank account to begin with. That's the basic level at which many poor countries in the globalized world are debating the issues I've described to you today, using, of course, principally the Indian example, but I hope that's relevant to many of you here in Oman. So at the end of the day, what I'm calling for is not just compassion, it's solidarity with your fellow human beings. As we see the headlines coming out of Ukraine today, as we see fellow human beings in distress, Solidarity is something that every one of us feels, and particularly as we see the plight of people helplessly trying to shelter from bombs, missiles, sometimes with food and water unavailable. It reminds me of an old Indian story from the Puranas. It's a typical in ancient Indian story of a sage and his disciples, and the sage one day says, so uh, tell me when does the night end? And one of the disciples says, at dawn, of course. And the sage says, I know that, but when does the night end and the dawn begin? So the first disciple, who's probably from the southern part of the country where so many of you are from, immediately says, um, oh, I know, I know, it's when the first streaks of sunlight glint off the palm fronds on the coconut trees, swaying in the breeze above the paddy fields. That is when the night ends and the dawn begins. The sage says, no, my son. So he turns to the other disciple, who's perhaps from the snowy north, uh, and, and he says, oh, I think it's when the first shafts of sunlight glint 
of the snow and ice on the mountaintops of the Himalayas, and you can see the light sparkling off against the sky, that is when the night ends and the dawn begins. And the sage says, no, my sons. He says, it is when two people from the opposite ends of our vast country come together, meet, embrace each other as brothers, realizing they sleep under the same sky, see the same stars, and dream the same dreams. That is when the night ends and the dawn begins. <laughs> the world has seen many a dark night in the last century or so. I think through your hard work in public health care and all the attempts that you want to achieve a better world, I hope that you will ensure a brighter dawn for the people of Oman and indeed for the world in the years to come. Thank you very much and all the best, Mabrook. Thank you, Dr. Shashi Tharoor. Your speech was truly a feast to our ears and we all got enlightened and inspired by the richness, richness of your words. They were truly exceptional, so thank you, sir. Thank you. Now it is time for the much awaited interactive session with Dr. Sashi Tharoor. He'll be glad to answer any questions that you may have. Will our volunteers please pass around the mic? Uh, congratulations for your 20-year uh, celebration. Uh, Dr. Tharoor, uh, big fan of you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Tharoor, I just want to have a question, not, not related to the healthcare sector. Why don't we have a uh, permanent ministers, not from, from an individual party, the, uh, the people who are uh, what do I say? Uh, they are uh, capable to handle some ministries. Let it be from any party, be it BJP, be it Congress, be it any party. People like you who are very capable of handling many more things, not uh, a particular party. So there should be some provision or something which should come out from the all party meetings that these are the permanent uh, people who are representing the people of India. I understand your sentiment and I sometimes hear this from other people as well. But in our parliamentary system, it doesn't work that way. Uh, once one party or one alliance has won an election, uh, the others go into opposition, and the government is only formed out of those on the winning side. So uh, it becomes a problem. And, and even if, for example, what you're suggesting was uh, offered by the prime minister, any person from the opposition accepting such a position would immediately dis be disowned by his own party and under the anti-defection law would even be expelled from parliament. So it doesn't work. I, I understand your feelings and many in India feel that it would be good if we could work across the political divide. Uh, but you know the idea of forming a national government of all parties has never been explored in India and as long as we remain in opposition I'm afraid we will have no chance to do what you're suggesting. No, no, not all parties like how we have IS officers. They remain the same if the party changes. So in that's the difference between the IAS yes. officers and the politicians, right? True. Yeah. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Tarur. My name is Sajit Nair. I am from your constituency, Tiruvannandapuram. Very privileged sorry, to have you. Yo? I am from Trivandrum, from your constituency. Oh. Very privileged to have you. Oh, good to see you. Thank you. <laughs> Actually, you have been a man who is versatile enough to handle so many things in your life, right from a diplomat and a scholar, a writer, everything, actually. And currently, you are just serving the people also. We would like to know that, you know, which role of yours you have been enjoying too much. I'm sure that, you know, it's a question which many people would ask you, but would like to hear from the host more. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, the truth is that I'm a human being with a number of responses to the world, some of which I manifest through my professional work, and some of which I manifest through my writing and my speaking. But it's still the same person. So um, the set of concerns, issues, ideas, and values that are in me, that are in my mind, that have come through my reflection, my reading, my thinking, those are essentially things that I show either through my work in government and parliament and the UN before that, or that I show through my writing uh, and, and through the exercise of my imagination and my point of view. So it's simply who I am, and I, I think I couldn't in all fairness choose any one aspect because then a part of my psyche would wither away. I am all of those things. 
and I try to be all of those things. I recognize that, however, with the passage of time, you become very, very conscious that there is no doubt that the uh, positions are transient and, and, and will not last. I'm already a former minister. One day I'll be a former MP, but I hope never to be a former writer. So in that sense, I hope the writing will be the one thing that I will be remembered for when the time comes. Dr. Taru, good evening. Good. Welcome to Oman. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, Dr. Taru, you goodbye to me. I'm leaving in 15 minutes. <laughs> okay, Dr. Taru, you inspire many. Uh, what inspires you, and uh, who inspires you the most? Well, you know, I think in, in practice, uh, part of this kind of motivation to do anything has to come from within. To that degree, uh, the the motivation to make a difference has always been there since my childhood. It must have been partially instilled on me by the example of my own parents, who were hard-driving, hard-working people, sincere, committed, and always anxious to extend themselves, and not just at work, but to the community. My father was very active in a number of social causes, and, and that desire to extend themselves and make an impact on others must have itself automatically communicated itself to me. Beyond that, I think growing up in India at the time that I did, there were a lot of figures of inspiration to learn about, to read about, and to follow the example of, whether it's some of our great political leaders like Prime Minister Nehru, Mahatma Gandhi himself, whether it was actually role models in other domains, outstanding cricketers, outstanding actors, and so on. There are many ways in which we could see excellence around us and strive to be like that. But ultimately, let me say to you, every one of us does not need an external inspiration. I genuinely believe that the best thing we can ask of ourselves, each of you, is to be the best you that you can possibly be. Nobody else can be you. You are who you are. Reach into yourself, find out what you are capable of, and don't let yourself down. Fulfill everything that you are capable of doing, and the world will be a better place. You can inspire yourself that way. Thank you all very much. Good evening, Dr. Shashi Tharoor. Our question is very simple from all of us here in Journalist. We had a few minutes before the event with you, and I understand you've been to the Sultanate of Oman five to seven times, and each time it's official. And you know, you've done your research on the health sector. I'm sure you've read more about Oman's history and the places. The next time, or if not now, which place would you like to explore in Oman, and which area would it be? Is it heritage, culture, or tourism? Well, I was just talking to the minister about that. I would love to go to Salala because all my uh, six or seven visits have been in Musket. And, uh, and Musket's beautiful, and I love the old fort, and I love the, the, uh, the scene here. And of course, the, the evident glowing development and prosperity of the capital is remarkable. But I, I would love to know what that ancient uh, city of Salala is like, and that marvelous story of the Kerala king, Cheruman Perumal, coming to visit the prophet during his lifetime and planting coconut trees uh, on the coastline, which are not native to, the, to this peninsula. And therefore, um, it's a direct story of the connection between India, and my part of India, and uh, Oman. So I would love to go and see that with my own eyes one day. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Tharoor. Uh, good evening, Dr. Tharoor. I am Shiva here. Uh, my question to you is like, there is a new world order which is setting in with the developments in Ukraine. So uh, what's your uh, opinion, how this will affect the uh, globalized world, and uh, what will be the impact on Indian economy and the Indian business outside it? Right, Thank I'm not you. sure it's a world, new world order. I think it's a new world disorder we are seeing, uh, which is the title of a book I wrote last year. I would say that if you look very seriously at, uh, at the short-term impact, it's going to be devastatingly negative for some, uh, for Oman, I think the news is better because oil prices today are at $114, uh, whereas uh, for a country like India, we just passed a budget last month in which the minister announced uh, that she, her, her figure for assumptions was $75 a barrel. You can see we are $40 short I and mean, we're going to be absolutely, uh, all our budget numbers are going to go for a toss, all the projections are going to go. Short term, world trade will be affected, world uh, exports certainly, and of course, 
financial markets have already shown the impact in the short term. In the longer term, everything depends on how long the conflict lasts. Many people hope that it will be swift and, and over very quickly and the Russians can declare victory and withdraw or that some sort of peace can be negotiated. But at the moment, we don't know how that's going to be. There are talks going on, I understand, uh, at some level uh, uh, between the current president of Ukraine and the Russians. If those talks result in a peace settlement, uh, maybe we will have a different outcome. But all I can tell you right now is that the short-term damage is bad. In the long term, I think the, the, the biggest uh, sufferers will be the Russians because of the perception that they have uh, violated uh, the laws of the international community. Uh, there are some principles we have always respected in India, certainly we've upheld them. A sovereignty of states, inviolability of borders, the inadmissibility of using force to, uh, to, to, uh, to uh, resolve your political disputes. And Russia has tossed all those aside. So while many in India would say that Russia has very legitimate security interests to uphold, the way in which they have chosen to uphold them is seen by many as a violation of international law and that will certainly have a long-term negative consequence for the way in which Russia is received by the rest of the world. And I think we'll have to see how that works out for our country in India. Uh, as you know, uh, uh, we've had the benefit of the US coming and paying more attention to East Asia, the Indo-Pacific, the Quad and so on. Will they now take their eyes back to Europe because of the Russian misadventure? And will they lose focus on the challenges provide, uh, 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 manifested by China in our region? These are questions that, again, we will have to watch very carefully in the months ahead. So for me, it's not a good news uh, in any way. I just hope that for a country like Oman, at least there will be the silver lining, that prosperity and a revival of the economy will follow from this uh, misadventure. But for many of us who are not oil producers, the news is pretty negative. Because as you said about uh, Indian scenario of health sector, and it's not a good news in many ways. But fortunately, we both are belong to one state, which is a role model for the rest of the India. So what is your stake and view on Kerala model of health? It's excellent. I mean, it's something that's been built up over, some would say, not just many decades, but even over a century. Uh, in my part, the part I represent in parliament, which is the old princely state of Travancore, Thiruvananthapuram, uh, the Maharajas set up some of the first public healthcare facilities and government hospitals going back to the 19th century. So there is a good tradition in Kerala. It's augmented by the fact that uh, our culture has never disregarded nursing, for example, as an unclean profession. A lot of people proudly study nursing. A lot of people, so our doctor-patient ratio is much higher than the Indian average. I gave the figure for India, but the Kerala figure is very much better. It's about the same as the United States. Uh, we have. Uh, a tremendous amount of uh, uh, efficiency in the execution of healthcare projects and a lot of community involvement. The manner in which Kerala has faced down the Nipah virus, followed by the, uh, the uh, COVID pandemic, uh, has been exemplary. And in many cases, uh, we avoided some of the problems that other parts of India suffered from. There was never an oxygen shortage. Nobody died for lack of a hospital bed or oxygen in the hospital beds. So while there have been tragedies, we are not immune from, from COVID or anything else. We have a system that works. And uh, many say it will be very difficult to replicate that elsewhere because it was built up over many, many decades and by all political parties. Healthcare, fortunately, has not been politicized. Communist governments, Congress-led government, UDF, LDF, etc., everyone has done their part to strengthen and run the healthcare system efficiently. So I'm, I'm very proud of it. And certainly it is a role model, as you rightly say, for the rest of India. Thank you, Dr. Shasi. No accident that we have Keralites running the, 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 the Badar and uh, Samar system here. Thank you, Dr. Shashi Thiroor, for this wonderful interactive session. All of us were enriched to hear you.